Hey, Joel. Hey, Lauren. Why do all the trees in Nebraska lean south? I don't know why. Because Kansas sucks. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> I shouldn't have laughed that hard if anyone in your family is listening to this. <laughs> guys i'm joel guy i'm lauren pauls and naomi was unfortunately trapped in a submarine while doing a deep sea archaeological survey so she will not be joining us this week she will be back at some point in the future uh but instead i'm joined by my lovely partner lauren pauls Aww. and today it's not going to be us thinking we're better than other people in relationships it's going to be lauren explaining why she knows more about kansas than i do mm -hmm. it's going to be great lauren what do we have to drink today? We have a French Fanta drink. It's mango dragon fruit soda. It's disappointing how other countries seemingly get the better flavors of mm -hmm. everything, whether it's soda or like obscure Twix bars or just random potato chips. Yeah, I agree. Where did we get this? We got this at Mass Street Soda in Kansas, actually, in Lawrence, Kansas, my hometown. It's disappointing how people in other states get better Fantas than people in Arizona. I like that. It's very mango forward. I'm getting only a hint of dragon fruit. I don't mind just the hint of dragon fruit, though. I think this would be a good mixer. I, I find it pleasant. Ooh, yeah, with some vodka. <laughs> Straight to the hard liquor. I like that. That's why we're together. What else would you mix it with? Milk. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, it's been a bit since we were last together on this show. Uh, have there been any major life updates for you in that time? Yeah, there have been a couple. I finally finally started my job at the public defender's office back in late january only nine months after only you nine months after i freaking graduated law school and whatever yeah it's it's whatever you okay. should be proud to know your public defenders are hard workers dedicated to the field that they've chosen yes so that happened i absolutely love it so far it's very fulfilling and it's not yet, at least, making me rip my hair out. Nice. So the hair's just gonna fall out naturally. My hair's just gonna fall out naturally. Male pattern balding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's why I love you. Yeah. Your sexy male patterns. Yeah. Lauren, we have a very special episode today that I was thinking I was gonna do with Naomi. And then I thought, why would I talk to my d sister when I could bring in an expert on the specific topic that I wanted to discuss? And the reason you're an expert on this is because the book I found is a book about the sex revolution in America, focusing on how small towns can kind of indicate how it spread across the country without like the influence of big cities. And the small town this book was based upon was Lawrence, Kansas, your hometown. I'm already going to push back. You're already going to push I'm back. I'm already going to push back. I don't think Lawrence, Kansas qualifies as a small town okay. and ever has. Boy, well, you've ruined the whole thesis of the podcast. I don't think that's really, maybe that's a bad representation. It's not of the book. a city. Okay, it's like, a bad representation of the book because the book says, essentially, we can jump right in if needed, that a lot of people's understanding of the sex revolution was that it happened on the coasts and that the big players okay. were major artists and political figures in California and in New York. Yeah. And it kind of ignores that all of these things had to happen elsewhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would have been confined to the coasts and not spread across sure. the whole nation. So in order to examine that, it kind of gathered a bunch of public records from Lawrence, Kansas, to see how the impacts of World War II and other things during the period from roughly the 1940s to the 1970s yeah. influenced Lawrence's culture and sort of Lawrence's understanding of these issues. Sure. As, you know, bigger patterns shape the nation as well. Would you, are, are you going to push back on that? No, I'm not okay. going to push back <laughs> on that. I just don't want the listeners to get a skewed perspective on Lawrence. I think Lawrence is a very sort of everyman town. Mm -hmm. It's a university town. It's in blood red Kansas. So there are lots of conservatives there, but it's a university town. So it draws a lot of li more liberal leftist minds too. And those P 
people meet and have to coexist in Lawrence. So Lawrence is a pretty good representation of picking and choosing people with different ideologies from around the country. So I think that's why it's a good case study for this. Not necessarily because it's a small town, because it's not a small town. It was almost the capital of Kansas. I took you to the museum. This is true. Missouri did have some strong feelings about that. So this book, Sex in the Heartland, is written by Beth Bailey. If any of our listeners listened to the From the Front Porch to the Back Seat episode, they will recognize the author. She did a very detailed analysis of how dating culture changed in the United States from the 1860s or so up until the 1960s. And this book kind of captures the same ideas, but it's not focused so much on dating culture as it is like the culture surrounding sex and attitudes towards it. Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean like actually having sex. I mean, discussions of it. I mean, um, people living together. I mean, queer identities and how those were perceived by the public. There's a lot of different areas that she explores in this book. And unfortunately, so I don't read the entire book to you. I have condensed it down. And there's some really interesting information in here that's not going to be discussed on this episode that I would encourage people to go and find a copy of the book and dig into. Because there's just so much happening during this period of time. And it is so incredibly researched that I feel I'm doing a disservice to it by trying to summarize it. But simultaneously, I think the information is important enough that it's worth to try to give kind of a brief encapsulation of her main arguments and theses. Um, So I think you did a really good job. Um, introducing the town of Lawrence. And I think let's jump back and talk about the sexual revolution in America and how it was perceived at the time. Okay. So she opens and she says, television, current events programs often walk a fine line between chronicling events and creating them. So in 1963, the popular TV show Open In scheduled a show entitled The Sexual Revolution in America. So let's kind of set the scene. It was 1963. John F. Kennedy was president. Going steady, quote-unquote, was the fad in high school. Female college students still had curfews, and many student handbooks included some reference to setting sexual standards. The pill had been available as a contraceptive for almost three years, but few doctors would prescribe it to unmarried women. People married young. More than half the women who got married that year were under the age of 21. Homosexuality was officially designated a mental illness by the American Psychiatric Association. And in fact, a televised discussion of sex was beyond the limits of acceptability. It was so like crazy that a bunch of producers uh, at the New York station responsible for it canceled the sexual revolution show and withdrew it from national distribution. So then the question is, well, is there a sexual revolution if you can't even talk about the sexual revolution? And she says, you know, a lot of the events we identify with the sexual revolution lay in the future from 1963. And in the early fall of 1963, no one could really, like, predict what was going to happen. That said, she says, you know, even up until this point, there had been a lot of changes in culture. So, for instance, Alfred Kinsey, you're familiar with yeah, him. And, yeah, you know, his handbook scale. on research yeah. had already revealed, you know, a decade earlier that there was a lot of craziness going on in American sex that people were unaware of. So, for instance, he had revealed 50% of American women had premarital intercourse, 37% of American men had participated in some sort of homosexual activity. A lot of people were thinking of sex as this like scary thing. And the phrase sexual revolution indicated danger. It was not like a good thing. Mm -hmm. It was, oh my God, you know, the, the deviants are coming to destroy us all. So she says, despite the way it's often portrayed in contemporary diatribes and debates, the sexual revolution was not created by a set of radicals on the fringe of American society and then imposed on the rest of the nation. It was forged in America's heartland as well, shaped not only by committed revolutionaries, but by people who had absolutely no intention of abetting a revolution in sex. Adding the heartland to our stories of the sexual revolution changes its meaning. This revolution was thoroughly of America. For this reason, this book is not about the cosmopolitan enclaves and radical gatherings on the East and West Coasts. It is also not the tale of larger-than-life actors like Hefner or Kinsey or Pincus, who too often stand in for the sexual revolution in our histories. These heroes of the revolution, its most committed activists, are indeed critical actors. America's sexual revolution would have looked much different without Playboy, the Kinsey Reports, or The Pill. It might not have happened in any recognizable form without the Summer of Love or the Stonewall Rebellion. However... If the challenges to America's sexual codes had taken place only in the streets of Greenwich Village and the hate Ashbury, there would have been no revolution. Did you say Greenwich? No. You you must have misheard me. It's I, it's Greenwich. I, I'm I'm very good at pronouncing all words, and I've spent a lot of time in New York as Okay, you know. so my least favorite thing about Joel <laughs> is that She has a list, don't you fret. He mispronounces words with absolute impunity. <laughs> Like, Chipotle, 
he will never say Chipotle correctly. He always says Chipotle. Chipotle. And I correct him every time. <laughs> I'll defer to a debate coach who in high school told me if I was giving an extemp speech about current affairs and I didn't know how to pronounce a word to just confidently pronounce it the same way every single time. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying that speech and debate gives you a lot of false confidence, and I've exploited that to this to this day. So why do we care about Kansas? Well, um, thanks to the Wizard of Oz. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the Wizard of Oz, Kansas is a state that most consistently represents the antithesis of bi-coastal sophistication. It is the ultimate provincial place, the ultimate not New York. Would you agree with that? This is what yes. Beth Bailey says. She says, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh. To Dorothy says she opens her eyes to the technicolor world of Oz. So like contrasting the boring nature of Kansas with the spectacular world of Oz. As Paul Nathanson puts it in Over the Rainbow, The Wizard of Oz is a secular myth of America. Kansas lies precisely at the geographical center of the country. It is midway between east and west, north and south. This region symbolically transcends time, space, history, and geography. It is, to use a metaphor from the wizard, the eye of the storm, the calm center around which national life swirls. This landscape belongs to none of the major sources of power. Kansas is thus the quintessential heartland state. Does that give you a little bit of pride? A little bit of hometown sensibility. You're looking at me with either it, disgust or. I don't eyes. know how I feel about that. I feel like. I feel that's written by someone who feels very proud of Kansas and may have spent some time in Kansas. Is she from Kansas? I don't know. We can look that up. Okay, we'll I'm going to look two. that up. What's her name? Beth Bailey. Uh, she wrote a number of books, Sex in the Heartland, something about. GIs having sex in Hawaii and then from the front porch to the back seat. Oh, she's um, a professor at University of Kansas. Is she? Oh, I thought she lived in Hawaii right now. Yeah, she had several books that dealt with Asian American culture in Hawaii. No, she's she's at KU. Oh, man, we should have an in-person interview next time. Yeah. We're... Wow. OK. No, we can. This is this is an aside, but we can definitely reach out to her. I, I did want to, and I had no idea that she was so accessible. Next time I'm not on saying she wants yeah. to speak to us, but very, very cool. Clearly, this this woman and Mr. Nathanson have a lot of respect for Kansas. I, I think it's it's a metaphor from someone who's struggling to figure out an identity for a state and differentiate it from all the other farming states. I think it's an accurate description from the sense that, yes, it is at the geographical center of the United States, and there's some very interesting historical events that happened in Kansas. Uh, but I think you could probably, you know, with 15 minutes of a Kansas historical book, you know, disprove some of those yes. locations and, you know, probably contrast it with other states in the region. So he, so he, he, sorry, she, Beth Bailey, focuses on Lawrence and says that it was the town of Lawrence that the battles of the sexual revolution were the most widely engaged and most visible to the citizens of the rest of Kansas. So obviously it's home to the University of Kansas. Um, and Lawrence, however, is very much a part of Kansas. So while the town's economy is largely dependent on the university, the university is funded by the state legislature at the taxpayer's pleasure and filled with the sons and daughters of the state's voters. Even though some of the town's residents had wished it possible at times, Lawrence could never ignore the state to which it belongs. And despite the centrality of the university, the town of Lawrence has always been much more than KU. Town conflicts have a long history in Lawrence as do tensions among the various other groups that make up the population. Many of Lawrence's people have not, quote, belonged it to the university. And the decades following World War II, those citizens range from members of the prosperous business community to farm families on the town outskirts. Lawrence's sexual revolution is not representative of America's experience, but is not because it lies in the heartland. It is specific to itself, as were the revolutions lived in San Francisco, New York, Atlanta, Ann Arbor, and Albuquerque. Different parts of the revolution flourished in different places. Lawrence, for example, never developed the large-scale singles bar scene that was so important to some of the nation's biggest cities. It never had a gay bathhouse culture or district full of adult bookstores and theaters showing X-rated films. At least, you never showed me that district when we were in town. There and are... A smattering, but well, there's no, like, district. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, when I was in Europe, you'd walk through certain neighborhoods, and suddenly there's 15 gay clubs all sure. next to each other, and I, yeah. I don't think Lawrence has something like that. Neither did the towns and suburbs and even urban neighborhoods in which the vast majority of Americans lived. People were talking about what was talking people were talking about during this period what was happening on a national scale, whether structural changes that touched their lives directly or simply awareness of geographically distinct events throughout the omnipresent mass media. However, the national events played themselves out on the local level in ways profoundly influenced by the specifics of local situations. Um, so by looking at 
you know, this beyond the famous personalities of the era, the rhetoric of the national organizations and the constructions of media to the experience of one Western university town, we can learn much about the social and cultural changes we call the sexual revolution. So I think that is a, a very poignant opener. It explains why she spent so sure. much time exploring, you know, this specific town. And I think it's helpful too, because sometimes people have questions like, you know, why is it this city has this distinct culture and mm -hmm. why did, you know, it never develop it similar to this other one. And in the book, uh, she explains a lot of the political, economic, and kind of cultural trends that happened within Lawrence mm -hmm. that you could map onto other cities. Be like, did this thing happen in other cities? If so, that probably explains why it's similar. If not, this might explain why it's mm -hmm. dissimilar. And I think in a similar way, you can listen to this podcast and hear about some of the things that influenced why the town went in one direction or another, and then map that on to sort of realities of today. Mm -hmm. So you might be like, you know, why is it this municipality in Arizona is so open to like queer culture and supportive of it, mm -hmm. while this municipality is like trying to pass drag bans? Um, and the answer... I think can largely be influenced by some of the same themes we see here. Mm -hmm. So I think we can jump in. Um, it's worth mentioning, you know, one of the big themes that's going to come up throughout the book is the birth control pill. Yeah. Uh, that was a very hot topic throughout this entire era. Um, the sex revolution also dealt a lot with queer culture, gay people who found after World War II that they were interested in trying to bring sort of the same communities that they had experienced during the war back to wherever they lived. Um, they also note that, you know, a big thing that influenced this era was geographical changes because World War II forced so many people around the country to move from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the norms from the past in the United States were no longer necessarily relevant because the norms you abided by when you lived in a town with 500 people and everyone knew your name and would judge you for your choices – no longer meant as much when you were yeah. like, stationed in another part of the country and away from anyone who could, you know, call you out to your family. Um, so how did World War II affect Lawrence? Do you know the answer to this? I think they discussed this in the museum we visited. I mean, a lot of ways. What did she say? Uh, uh, we'll get to that. W what's, what's the big thing you're thinking of? Lawrence was affected a lot like other college towns, in that a good portion of its population, which is college students at that time, male college students, were sucked off into the war. Mm -hmm. That was not good phrasing. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of it that way. Uh, well, um, boy, your Freudian slips is uh, going to really propel this podcast. No, the sad thing is I thought about my phrasing there and it still came out like that. Um Sorry, everybody. Um, but anyway, so the town, the composition of the town changed significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're correct that a lot of native Lawrence people had to participate in the war. I think there's another thing, which is there was actually a huge influx of people studying at the University of Kansas during this period in conjunction with the war effort. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. It changed the layout of the town. It did actually increase. The male population of Lawrence did increase during this period because of the war effort. So let's talk about how that happened. And this is going to lead to some interesting trends. Um, so a big challenge to the established order during World War II came from a conjunction of federal actions and market forces. The experience of the war unsettled local cultures. People moved in unprecedented numbers during this period. More than 12 million men and women served the armed forces. That is just mind-blowing to me, thinking yeah. about the scale of World War II now. More than 15 million civilians moved to another county or another state, most for defense-related work. The fact that people who never traveled more than 100 miles from their homes moved across the country, across the world, where they lived in close proximity to people from vastly different backgrounds, fundamentally altered the nation's cultural mm -hmm. landscape. Um, so, like, the American people, to a very certain extent, had always been mobile, but mobility was typically in a specific direction, mm -hmm. like western, sure. or, you know, up and down the northeast coasts. Um, it had never been kind of all over, kind of, you know, just putting all the puzzle pieces in a box and shaking them up, and suddenly the puzzle has been, you know, completely changed. Um, so, like, one big example is uh, a lot of 
people of different races were brought all around the mm-hmm. country to places they had not traditionally lived. And this was like a big upset to local cultures. Um, it also notes at the end of the war, people didn't always land where they started out. Even those who went back home, settled down, married the girl or boy next door, better or worse, carried something of their far away experiences with them. In countless minor arguments and adjustments over dinner tables or in the workplace, their new ideas and new ways unsettled local knowledge. But the culture of the post-war years is sufficed with conformism, materialism, and a desire for stability. One can also see a people negotiating the cultural dislocations of war and its aftermaths. Both sexual mores and the role of sex in America's public life would forever be changed. Um, More people during this period were also included in American society after the war than before. Different sorts of people began to count, to be visible in the American landscape, to have a voice. From today's standpoint in society that debates the meaning of multiculturalism, the culture of the post-war four years seems repressively homogenous. It was an undoubtedly white, middle-class culture, assimilative in its intent with penalties for those who did not conform. Nonetheless, the process of assimilation, such as universal high school education, drew people in from radically different backgrounds into what defined as a national American culture. Women, African Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanics, and others who had served the country during the war were now laying claim to their place in civilian society. Their participation was changing the face of America. Um, So, sex itself was also a critically important issue during the war. Issues of sex and its governance were virtually omnipresent in wartime America. The marriage rate skyrocketed, and were these marriages appropriate? What rules should govern the behavior of couples separated for the duration? What about the problem of victory girls, who seem to confuse promiscuity with patriotism? How could the federal government guarantee a wholesome environment in training camps? How might venereal disease, the common companion of war dislocations, best be controlled? How could homosexuals be detected and barred from military service so not to pose a threat to other men? How could towns maintain a clean and wholesome environment? environment when inundated by war workers, sorry, by war workers or servicemen and their need for recreation. These were not questions to debate at leisure, but pressing issues made more so by the high stakes of the war. In discussing sex, Americans debated not only issues of sexual morality, but also the relative power of the state and of local elites, meaning of gender and social class, questions of individual rights, and freedoms in relation to the concept of the public good. So in 1940, fewer than 15,000 people lived in Lawrence. Um, So maybe calling a small town earlier was a mistake. Yeah. Um, Though KU and Haskell students added significantly to that number from September through May. Lawrence had a large professional class. Almost a third of its adult residents had attended or graduated from college at a time when the national figure was about 16%. So about twice the national figure at the time. That doesn't surprise me. 47% of adult men had a grade school education or less, so that a graph of social class in Lawrence resembled a two-humped camel much more than a bell curve. The missing middle had significant implications for politics and public policy. We don't really get into this in my stripped-down version of the book. The book itself gets much more into this, but there was very much a um, professional elite in Lawrence making recommendations and then kind of a lower class of farmers who were either pushing back or in agreement. Um, there, there was very few times when everyone's interests were perfectly aligned. Yeah, I think that's sort of what I was talking about earlier. What makes Lawrence unique mm-hmm. is that sort of split between traditionally urban and traditionally rural. Yeah, and for people who haven't been to Lawrence, Kansas, there is like, I wouldn't call it dense, but a denser downtown than most of mm-hmm. Kansas. And then you drive 15 minutes and it's all like farmland. People on, you know, big acreage. Um Is that a fair description of the layout? Maybe more than 15 minutes. I was going to say 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, okay. A 20 minute city. My bad. Uh, Lawrence was also fairly homogenous in terms of race. About 90% of its population claimed European ancestry. But because of the town's abolitionist legacy, it also had a substantial and longstanding African American community. Um, What are they talking about there? Abolitionist legacy? Oh, I mean, John Brown and shit. (laughs) Like, John Brown. No, um, so Kansas and Missouri came into the United States at about the same time. Yeah. And there was, this is just an overview for your listeners who might not be as familiar with Civil War history. And I'm not very familiar with Civil War history. I'm just more familiar with Kansas history. And um, so Kansas and Missouri came into the Union at about the same time. Then there was a law saying that for every slave state that was admitted to the union a free state had to be admitted to the union and vice versa Mm -hmm. so missouri wanted to be a slave state but they also wanted kansas to be a slave state and kansas was voting 
about whether or not to be a free state or a slave state. And Missouri sent over lots of people who, with varying degrees of violence, would try to disrupt these votes because they knew that Kansas was leaning towards becoming a free state. Yeah. Um, so Kansas is obviously home to John Brown. Um, who, for those who are less historically astute, is primarily associated with the Harper's Ferry Rebellion, mm -hmm. an unsuccessful attempt to rouse the slaves of Harper's Ferry Town in Virginia? I think so. Uh, he, to revolution. He's the guy who smuggled a bunch of guns under Bibles. So there's a big, yeah. that's what you might remember from history class. There's a big mural of him in the Kansas Capitol with a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other with his arms all stretched out. Um, so that all that is to say that Kansas not only had an abolitionist history, but fought long and hard for abolition. And in Lawrence specifically, that played out in a few ways. Lawrence was burned to the ground... I want to say twice, three times. I think that's what the museum's are um, By people from Missouri. Because Lawrence was the prospective capital. It wasn't the territorial capital. That was Lecompton. But it was the prospective capital for the state. And Lawrence was actually destroyed so many times by ruffians from Missouri that uh, the capital had to be moved to Topeka, which we all know is an objectively worse city. <laughs> um, there were also um, lots of... So you've heard the term carpetbaggers before, right? Sure. Why don't you explain that for... Tell, no, tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm not sure if this is the right term for what's happening here. But in from, from what I remember, carpetbaggers are former slaves who moved north at the end of the Civil War. I believe that's correct. Okay. So Lawrence had a lot of settlements, not necessarily in the city, but very, very near it, of carpetbagger communities. So there were a lot of black people who were settling in and around Lawrence mm -hmm. at the time that this was all happening. Well, yes. at, after the time that it sure. was burned down. So Lawrence is more racially diverse than other parts of Kansas because it has this history of abolition and because it has a history of settlement post-Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, I should mention one of the things that I did cut out was a chapter that in part explores kind of the Black Power movement and how it impacted. Oh, yeah. Um, I... I thought it was very interesting and it plays a crucial role in the development of Lawrence. Um, but unfortunately I think it's very much a deviation from the focus of this podcast mm -hmm. and kind of the exploration of the culture that's surrounding it. Again, I would strongly suggest you find this book at the library or get a copy yourself because it's, it's just really meticulously researched and the prose is great. Um, so Lawrence in the 1920s is in this interesting place where it's trying to economically develop probably due to the influence of a lot of the town leaders. Mm -hmm. And there's some like really good hopes there's some really good hopes of, you know, uh, how the economy is going to benefit Lawrence in the future. In 1927, for instance, they had got the first paved highway linking Lawrence to Topeka. Uh, people had thought of a coast to coast highway that would pass directly through Lawrence. Like they thought they were going to be the center of the United States for intercommerce travel. Uh, unfortunately, the Great Depression happened. So the price of wheat, which was a big thing the economy depended upon, dropped from 99 cents a bushel in 1929 to 33 cents a bushel in 1932. Dust storms swept the plains. Um, Kansas was basically devastated by that during the Dust Bowl. Um, enrollment at the University of Kansas fell in the 30s, as did employment. Faculty salaries were reduced by 25%. 12% uh, fewer of Lawrence's families owned homes in 1940 than in 1930. However, federal money kept Lawrence afloat, despite the Republican-leaning city government's reservations about the New Deal. And the university regained its pre-crash enrollment by 1936. While the state of Lawrence lost more than 100,000 people in the 1930s, Lawrence's population grew by almost 5%. Mm -hmm. It suffered in the Great Depression, but not nearly as badly as other communities. And at the end of the decade, it remained stalled in its quest for economic progress, but still desired that growth from before. So this is one of the big things that begins all these developments in Lawrence. Lawrence has done better than its neighbors. It has a thriving university. It's recovered due to assistance from federal grants. And that's going to be a really big trend. 
where the city has made these connections and has this desire for growth, and that's going to push a lot of the policies. So the outbreak of World War II, some of the town's leaders saw an opportunity. Lawrence's Chamber of Commerce formed a defense planning committee chaired by Fred's, Frank Stockton, the dean of KU's business school. Their goal was simple, to attract war industry. So they're like, oh my God, there's going to be so much of a need for munitions and people mm-hmm. learning and all this stuff. Let's get in on that. So they had plans drawn up for the Sunflower Ordnance Works, which would be manufacturing smokeless powder. It was to be built on an 8,000-acre site outside of Lawrence. A plant spokesperson estimated that construction would require up to 28,000 workers, almost double Lawrence's population. Construction workers will descend upon Lawrence like locusts, he predicted. Um, So some of the editors of local papers, like the Journal World, uh, stressed the importance of control. By planning for growth, the editors argued we can avoid the mistakes of other towns which did not start to plan until it was too late. Their concerns are not simply about overtaxed infrastructure or infectious disease, but also about sexual conduct. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, So in our planning, we must all remember the great importance of keeping Lawrence a clean and wholesome city, they write, heralding heralding a theme that would be reiterated frequently during the war years. So what were they worried about, Lauren? They were worried about a flood of single men entering their community. So uh, Douglas County, for instance, sent 3,300 people to war, as you were talking about. Douglas County is the county that Lawrence is in, for the record. And of those, 102 of them died. And so they knew, having already dispatched people to the armed forces that they would need men to make up this shortfall. Um, Women, women would be able to do some of that work. At one point, 60% of the ordinance works operating personnel were female, but the plant would also attract many male workers who would be rough working class men without these steadying influences of family or long-term community ties. Housing would be tight and trailer camps would materialize. So then they wondered, well, what are they going to be doing when they're here? They're obviously going to be pumping money into the local economy, but what would they be doing with their money? Mm -hmm. Women in drink, according to the stereotype. However, except for beer, Lawrence was dry, and neither the passage nor the repeal of national prohibition had much significance for this town's public life. Women also presented problems because they were concerned um, not necessarily about the town's daughters, but about prostitutes. Um, Many citizens believed that there were none, um, but they thought maybe that because all these men were coming in, because there'd be so much money, this would attract them. Mm-hmm. So um, they were closely, the, the the newspaper writing about this, the Journal World, was closely allied with the town's business interests. It ran another editorial about the munitions plant in late April of 1942, and this piece was titled Munitions Plant Good or Evil. Um, it, it explained that there were obvious benefits to like bringing in these munitions plants, yeah. excluding all the economic growth, but obviously it would have to be balanced with all the negative stuff that they discussed. Um, so the ordinance works did get approved. It never reached the proportions oper- imagined in 1942, but it did have a peak employment of 12,000 workers operating on 24 hour shifts. It was the largest rocket powder plant in the world. And it did have a profound effect on the small but ambitious town of Lawrence. By 1943, 26 new bars crowded together in the small downtown mm-hmm. district. That sounds about right. There's a lot of bars. There in are that a lot area. of bars in that area. Yeah. <laughs> and a big thing was like, it, it, it was a dry town, but they're also like, okay, if we allow beer, we might as well allow like as many of them to apply for licenses. Like, it, it, and actually, licenses were pretty easy to get. So it says bars were boomtown business. Uh, licensing requirements were relatively lax. Licenses cost fifty dollars, and applicants had to be at least twenty-one years old. Residents of Kansas for at least a year. Residents of Douglas County for at least six months, and no convictions for crimes involving moral turpitude in the past two years. Even so, licensees were often fronts for the real entrepreneurs. Um, so, for instance, a forty year old aunt stood in for the true owner of the wonder bar which occupied a prominent position at lawrence's major downtown intersection Mm -hmm. is that still there the wonder bar i don't think so okay in addition to a name with an oddly germanic resonance the wonder bar had only one toilet for both sexes and illegal venetian blinds which screened the activities of its patrons from passerby in the case of the wonder bar uh, wonder bar the blinds hid illegal gambling in other bars the blinds hid dancing which was strictly prohibited in such establishments so they're like okay we're gonna have a lot of men come in we don't want our daughters becoming prostitutes we don't want to attract prostitutes we will at least you know make it easier for them to get bars Mm -hmm. and the bars are like well everyone's serving booze what if we offered something extra like Mm -hmm. dancing or uh gambling uh so you could already see (laughs) this might spiral out of control um, so many of Lawrence's upstanding citizens believed that public drinking and illicit sex went hand in hand. Some of their citizens were outraged when 
people heard about, you know, some of the stuff that was going on downtown. In 1943, the Kansas River Baptist Convention publicly called on government officials to ban the sinister presence of alcohol and vice. Uh, many people disapproved of the excesses, but also saw them as just like a part of the wartime. Mm -hmm. And were like, oh, well, as soon as the war is over, everything's going to go back to normal. So there were some people who were concerned about that initially. A lot of people were like, eh, probably the money's good. And so they're willing to put up with it, not really anticipating this would permanently alter the town forever. Um, in practical terms, concerns about the illicit sex and drinking that commonly flourished around military training camps and war worker encampments quickly led to the expansion and reorganization of the county health unit. What had been a small part-time unit concerned largely with sanitary inspections, particularly of milk production, was reconstituted as a full-time federally funded agency meant to play a key role in Lawrence's war. Sanitary issues became even more important to the influx of ordinance plant workers who overtaxed Lawrence's supply of adequate housing, already depleted by years of economic depression. The true justification for the health department's expansion, however, lay in wartime fears of unchecked venereal disease. So they accept federal funding to aid with all of, like, the problems associated with the new people coming in and mm -hmm. unfit conditions. But the federal government is concerned about one thing, and that's venereal disease. Yeah. The reason for that was venereal disease was a really big issue during the Great War. Over and over again, the American public had heard that venereal disease had cost 7 million man days of service during World War I. And the first months of the war, an anti-VD short film played in movie theaters throughout the country. In defense of the nation, it showed a snarling Edward G. Robinson type with a defense map of the United States. Women and girls are sent out according to carefully laid plans to brothels, to low cafes and bars, and to those streets where they spread venereal disease and disorder among those upon whom the defense of the nation depends, the narrator proclaims. Um, so a lot of it was public hysteria. A lot of it was like exaggerating the impacts of, you know, women of the night during this period. Um, but there were also physical consequences of venereal disease. Um, Congress had passed a number of laws accepting the logic that germs did not know state lines. They had created the, uh, they passed the National Venereal Disease Control Act, which provided funds for local VD clinics. And as a result, like, they knew this was an issue and they wanted to focus on it and prevent it during World mm -hmm. War II. Um, the Board of Health viewed federal funds with suspicion. Um, they thought that the flood of money could lead to unwarranted interference from the federal government. Uh, they really didn't understand the magnitude of the problem, and in steps Dr. H.L. Chambers. Do you know about him? He seems like a pretty influential person. I actually don't know about him. Okay. Um, so, I, I think it's... One thing that's frustrating in a lot of history is that there's this myth of, like it's not great sold men. It's like, like the great men theory, you know, yeah. it's like individual people shaped history. Uh -huh. And I think often we underestimate the role that their advisors, that their subordinates played sure. in their decision-making. And we attribute too much of their decisions to like their knowledge. Individual not, prowess. Yeah. yeah. Consulting with other people and making decisions influenced by them. In this case, HL chambers played a really inordinate role in how the town dealt with issues of venereal disease. And as a result, kind of how they perceived the impact of venereal disease upon their population. Yeah, you have to remember that most of my knowledge of Lawrence history comes from my third grade class. That so we did totally not talk fair. about venereal disease in well, my third grade. The class. other thing was like this dude died pretty soon after the war. Uh -huh. So like he, his impact was during World War II. It, it trickled over into the future, but like his primary activity was during World War II. The reason for that, he was 73 years old when he takes oh, over to run the Department of Health. That's an old dude. He had served as a doctor in France during the Great War. He had founded KU Student Health services and even served a stint as the counter director of public health in 1920s. Um, however, he had to replace the former uh, public health director, Dr. Mott, um, who I guess had um, gone to Anchorage to run a hospital during World War II. Um, so he needed to run this VD clinic that was sponsored by federal funds. And he wanted and needed to acknowledge the full scale of the medical problem. Like if you don't talk about VD issues, they're going to spread really quickly. Sure. And then like it's out of control and you have all these, you know, people down for the count. Your economy mm -hmm. falls apart. Like obviously there's a lot that rests upon being able to address VD. Uh, during the war, the clinic carried a far heavier caseload than in the pre-war years. Clinic visits uh, for treatment in 1941 totaled 1,100 so 1941, 1,100 visits for VD treatment. In 1943, it was five times that number. So oh in two God. years, like, it just skyrockets. Wow. So he didn't want to raise public alarm about these statistics, fearing that they would provoke a moral backlash against sexuality in general. So thus, he attempted to manage public fears about sexual morality by putting a careful spin on the information he released. So 
Again, this is why he's important, because he very easily could have sparked a moral panic. Here's this 73-year-old mm-hmm. guy being like, oh my God, this is out of control. Your daughters are going off with all sorts of men. We need to control this. Yeah. Like, he could have started a moral panic and shut all of this down, but he didn't, and he made like a really clever decision here. Um, so people were talking about this. People were already concerned about the moral health. Uh, there were a lot of rumors around Lauren's parents that schoolgirls were taking up with soldiers and war workers. Um, a, the health department to combat these invited a public school nurse to speak at its monthly meetings, um, but not many people bought it. They all mm-hmm. thought that like high schoolers were shacking up with soldiers. A mm-hmm. um, lot of gossip, a lot of gossip in the small town. Um, unfortunately, the reason everyone believed this was it might have been partially rooted in truth, but also here's where national trends come in to have an impact. So in 1942, for instance, Newsweek ran a cover story on teenage crime, citing the example of Kansas City, which was just (laughs) over the border in Missouri. The article explained the rising danger of prostitution, both professional and casual, by girls anywhere from 12 on up. Feminine camp followers, publicly dubbed victory girls and cuddle bunnies, who defended their relations with men in the armed forces on the grounds of patriotic duty. Posters expanded portrayals of dangerous women from the obvious prostitutes to include wholesome young girls. One caption read, she may look clean, but... Dot, dot, dot. The March of Time newsreel, Youth in Crisis, which appeared on movie screens throughout America in 1943, showed an adolescent girl with experience far beyond her age, a victory girl necking with a soldier on a public street. And just days before the outbreak of rumors in Lawrence, Time had informed his national readership the khaki-mad victory girl was a worse menace than the prostitute, perhaps accounting for as many as three out of four venereal infections. These victory girls and prostitutes who do not charge for their services were presented as threats to the nation, undermining national security through sexual delinquency. Wow. Yeah. So we discussed this in the front porch to back seat episodes, Mm -hmm. but one of the big problems for like moral authority figures during this era was every single time they'd have national conversations about like topics that offended them. It would just alert a lot of young people that these things were accepted. Sure. Yeah. Like, they were like, oh my God, people are necking in movie theaters now. And young people are like, you can neck in movie theaters? That's yeah. incredible. Um, you know, you, you have people like Oprah now, you know, in the early 2000s, talk about like rainbow parties and whatnot. Yeah. And I don't think they existed yeah. <laughs> prior to <laughs> Oprah talking about them. But yeah, but the, 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 the very act of giving national attention to an issue makes it known to young people that other people are doing it and uh-huh. they shouldn't feel bad about having the desire or want to do something. Yeah. And that was a big thing in Front Porch to Back Seat where it's like most of dating culture developed because older people in like prominent publications were complaining about these issues, just popularizing these yeah. issues to younger audiences. Um, so in the same way, national news media is saying, oh my God, young people are shacking up with soldiers. And so the people of Lawrence are obviously mm-hmm. going to be impacted by that. So Lawrence talks uh, to, uh, sorry, Chambers talks to Lawrence. Um, he, he downplays any sense of emergency over their moral health. Um, he also rejects the idea that VD was spread in Lawrence through traffic and white slaves, which was another idea that was popularized oh. during the war. Uh, it was women captured virtually enslaved for immoral purposes. And he said that the women who were engaged in sexual activity in Lawrence were doing so for, of their own volition and for their own purposes. Mm-hmm. So he said there were four reasons that people might be involved in this. The first was the general liberalizing of moral standards. So everyone in America, people are becoming more like morally loose, whatever. Mm -hmm. This is not like unique to our community. Second, the pseudo patriotic desire to make the man and the armed forces happy. Uh, Third is the inclination to grab off a little easy money. Um, There's no doubt that like men in the service had money that a lot of people in the community probably didn't and Mm -hmm. were able to spend it. Uh, The dollop did an episode about American troops in Australia during Mm -hmm. World War II, and the Australian men hated American soldiers. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was the American troops had both access to better goods, like sold on base, but also significantly more pocket money. And Mm -hmm. so Australian women were just dating and marrying American men left and right. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, uh, American soldiers had access to better sanitary facilities, like showers and soap than Uh Australian men did, so they tended to smell better. (laughs) But yeah, it's a problem where like these people have resources that you don't. And so there's the desire to, you know, get a little bit. Yeah. And then he finally says the fourth reason is some women 
enjoy sex. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that community? Again, this is a doctor in his 70s talking in the 1940s being like, oh yeah, some women enjoy sex, it, which seems a little crazy. You could easily imagine someone being like, oh no, this is all happening. I've mm -hmm. seen it firsthand and, you know, trying to push whatever his, you know, religious or personal prejudices were. But no, he took like a very um, a, a calm and method, 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 methodological methodical approach Metho oh, to this. Yeah. Yeah. So he made it a policy to lean to the side of mercy and kindness, which meant exercising his right to parole patients more frequently than police or city commissioners deemed prudent. Um, so he says the idea of salvaging people made more of an appeal than it formerly did during this period. Um, so he wasn't like trying to detain people. He wasn't trying to like call them out in public. He was treating them and letting them go. Mm -hmm. Like he, again, super cool dude during this yeah. period. So rates of venereal diseases are one of the few ways to measure changes in sexual behavior in Lawrence during the war. Like, it, it's difficult to, like, survey people and talk about sexual behavior because a lot of people have reasons to lie sure. about how much sex they engage in. So VD is, like, one of the few ways we can say emphatically people mm -hmm. were having sex. The amount of sex that was being had changed. Yeah. Um, there's one other thing that changed besides people having sex in this community, likely due to the influence of bars and what we might call the mm -hmm. Greek girls. And that was the other men who were not workers who were put in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And I alluded to this earlier, but there was a large group of men temporarily located in Lawrence who were several thousand military trainees. Um, they came from all over the United States. One could not call them homogenous, but they were all deemed capable of advanced study and high achievement. So many Navy men were studying engineering, Army men concentrated in the liberal arts and the school of medicine. These men were judged to have the ability to succeed in college when a college education was not common. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we cited earlier that like 33% of men in the town had graduated high school. Yeah. And that was considered like above average for the For country. sure. So the Army is like, we need people who can design airplanes we yeah. need people who can you know approve the efficiency of our operations we need people who can study health clinics and make recommendations for mm -hmm. how to you know decrease the number of deaths and so they need people who are college educated so they send them to college because they think they're more valuable than just sending them off as cannon fodder. Mm -hmm. so lawrence's leaders did not see this group as equivalent to the war workers so they're like dirty smelly ruffians on one mm -hmm. hand working in the mission works and then like clean shaven polite young men in the college mm -hmm. um because these men were doing exactly what like all the other college students have been doing before they were shipped off to war so the townspeople were like you know we should do something nice for all of those like clean beautiful well-spoken men in our universities mm -hmm. rather than thinking oh these men are going to go to the same bars and like illicit dance halls they were like we need to provide accommodations because these men would never stoop there but if we don't provide them something they might be you know drawn into these lives mm -hmm. of crime. um so they were less concerned about protecting their town's wholesomeness from the men in uniform than from those in overalls they did believe the military presence required planning and careful management so at first the rationale was patriotic it was lawrence's responsibility to provide hospitality to the young men who would fight for their country a year into the war the idea was um and this was something that was written to the mayor the head of the community service league insisted we must provide wholesome entertainment for those servicemen during their weekends at liberty this is no longer a need but an urgent necessity so this was done by a woman named Marge Stockton, a middle-aged, upper-middle-class married white woman with almost uh, grown children. So she was like an older woman in a position of power in the town and was like, we need to do something for like all of these brave servicemen. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really get into this in the text. Uh, Beth Bailey doesn't really discuss this. One might even argue that this was like in self-interest where she's like, you know, one of my daughters could marry these <laughs> outstanding servicemen if we like provide them the opportunity to meet. Um, but what Beth discusses is <laughs> their solution to this. They're like, okay, we can't send the bars. We can't give them alcohol. We don't want them illicitly gambling. What if we open publicly sanctioned dance halls for them to mm. meet people in the community? So um, it opened a servicemen's center in the Lawrence Community Building from July 1942 through January 1945. Um, it offered USO-type amenities such as playing cards and writing paper, cookies and cokes, and ping-pong tables, but its major function was staging a dance every Saturday night. It was a non-commercial recreation meant to keep young men out of beer halls and taverns and out of the arms of the wrong sort of women. While the dances were open to all men in uniform, they were not open to women. Instead, they were staffed by members of a junior hostess league. These young women had been approved by the service league committee on the basis of an application, two letters of reference from adults in the community, oh and evidence God. of parental permission for those who are not self-supporting. It is community service in the form of dancing with servicemen. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
they did kind of discuss this in uh, Front Porch to Back Seat, where a lot of adults concerned about sexual activity during the era of the 1940s to 1970s would arrange dances at middle schools mm -hmm. and high schools. And that's where a lot of like high school and middle school traditions come from, is adults trying to control where their children are interacting with other children. Mm -hmm. Being like, well, if we let them run loose in the streets, they're going to get up to mischief. But if we like carefully plan entertainment for them, mm -hmm. they won't get up to mischief. Um that may or may not have worked. Um, it did work better than a lot of other U.S. programs across the country. Uh, so in Hawaii, for instance, where men rotated away from the front for R&R &R before being sent back to the Horror of the Pacific War, uh, USO troops had to contend with huge crowds of men jousting for the attention of some small number of women. Drunken brawls were common, and some men were lewd or sexually aggressive towards women who had volunteered to dance with them. However, in Lawrence, the dances are not very different from college mixers, and Stockton Servicemen Center operated without public incident for almost three years. And then the woman, Miss Stockton, who organized this, received like a letter of commendation from the Secretary of the Navy. Um, so the town experiments with controlling dating life mm -hmm. during this period. They're trying to offer an alternative to, you know, all the illicit stuff going on. And arguably, it kind of worked out. But in another way, it also made the community more likely to accept the idea that dance halls and, like, places the youth could interact were mm -hmm. a lot more acceptable. Yeah. It removed, I think, some of their inhibitions about dating culture that had been in place before the war, mm -hmm. where a lot more of the dating was, like, people introducing each other, you know, families setting up dates mm -hmm. uh, that we discussed in Front Porch in the back seat, and very much towards a women and men have the opportunity to decide among themselves, you know, the people they want to interact with and they can do some. And so in these like wholesome environments. So there's a liberalization of dating culture that happens during this period as a direct result of them trying to avoid good, pure service men from going down mm -hmm. the tubes during, you know, a period of uh, emotional uh, toil. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's, that's a really interesting effort. Um, and I think the elite control is very much shook up during this period. Um, another trend that happens during this period that impacts elite control is that economic growth undermined the authority of local social and business elites. Um, so when the war began, almost half of the town's men had eight years or less of formal education. After the war, federal authorities supported by the managers of America's leading corporations sought universal high school education. By 1950, 86% of Lawrence's 14 to 17 year olds were still in school. By 1960, it was 91%. Because of the GI Bill, many veterans from economically lower class backgrounds got college educations. For several years, veterans made up well over half of KU's burgeoning enrollment. These changes would broaden the pool of those who had the skills and the social positions to engage in public discussions about social policy and social order. So there were concerns from the elites about how this would impact the economy by bringing mm -hmm. in people. And I think what was unanticipated was, oh no, our town's going to get more educated. Yeah. Like as a result of all this federal support, as a result of all these post-war things, suddenly, you know, there's no longer as much of a class divide. There isn't this camel hump that was discussed yeah. before. Now there's a lot more homogeneity across yeah. the entire town. And so um, when before there might have been people who could, you know, by themselves stop certain things from happening mm -hmm. in the community. Now there's a lot of different voices offering a lot of different opinions. And I'm not yeah. saying all of them are inclined towards like liberalization of sexual attitudes, but boy, it, it definitely, definitely has a uh, impact on this. Mm -hmm. um, so there were some concerns after the war about uh, uh, bars and taverns. And for a brief period, they decided that they needed to stop all this illicit activity. In February 1946, the Douglas County Commissioners passed a regulation banning dancing in any establishment that sold beer. Uh, this was based on a report from the county health department, which in turn was based on information received from military authorities that most of the new VB cases in Lawrence during the war had resulted from contact made in such establishments. So a lot of different religious groups backed it. So again, people in sort of control and positions mm -hmm. of authority were in support of this effort. Uh, the problem was it had some unintended consequences. So the Lawrence Country Club had to cancel a dance scheduled for high school students, even though no beer was to be served, because it held a beer license. Mm. So they set up all these opportunities for people to have good, clean fun, and then accidentally prevent people from having good, clean fun. Yeah. The county commissioners had meant to target the beer joints and taverns, not the country club, but it also didn't actually reduce drinking. People just got in their cars and went elsewhere. Yeah. So during this period, people were acquiring vehicles, which wasn't as common before the war, and now they could just get in a car and drive to another town that would yeah. serve them alcohol and allow them to dance. 
Uh, so uh, the owner of the Skyline Club out on 23rd Street at the margins of town told a reporter, young people come to my place and order a glass of beer and then they want to dance. When I tell them they can't dance in my cafe, they finish their beer and go off to Topeka or Leavenworth or Kansas City. Where they can drink and dance in the same place. If controlling sexual contact was an issue, these boundaries were too permeable for local control. So after a seven-month struggle, the commissioners rescinded the rule, warning club proprietors they'd be held responsible for the conduct of their patrons, and they must operate among decent, respectable lines if they wanted to remain open. The rhetoric was face-saving at best, for this effort at control had been decisively defeated. So, already, authority is being overturned. There were attempts mm-hmm. to return to the pre-war war standards during this era that just did not work out. Mm-hmm. All these bars are probably offering a lot of taxable income to the town, and now if they're decreasing their income, the town has a financial interest in keeping them open. So there's some weird entanglements that are going on. Sure. Here. And we'll end, I guess, this... A discussion today with the last thing that was um, a problem during this period, and that was the flourishing paperback industry of the 1940s. Mm-hmm. Um, so the most popular of this era was pop. Oh man, the most popular was Popular Libraries, 1948 cover from the 1925 bestseller, The Private Life of Helen of Troy. You can only imagine what sorts of content was in that. <laughs> Her lust caused the Trojan War, a banner headline proclaimed, and Helen appeared in a tight gauzy drapery, drapery that concealed nothing including her lack of pubic hair. It was popularly known as the nipple cover. It came to represent the commodification of sex in pulp paperbacks and part of a growing trend of like lewd material being sold in corner stores. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on and being published during this period. Uh, there were a lot of cheap paperbacks, science fiction, detective novels that often half naked women on their covers. Um, there was also a lot of tales of lesbian love, um, mm-hmm. which concerned some people. And then Playboy was introduced in 1943. Um, the first issue uh, sold 53,000 copies. Um, it had combined a lot of different things like really high quality illustrations, photographs, um, long form content. And so it was making like this stuff a little more acceptable than it had mm-hmm. been before. So again, moral authorities are deeply offended. They're like, oh my God, this stuff is being sold in, in our newsstands. And again, this is where national media comes in to stir things up because people were probably aware of this, mm-hmm. but the national media like really puts a, a face to the problem. In 1952, this is after the war, Reader's Digest, which circulated 10 million people at the time, ran an expose titled Filth on the Newsstands. And by December, the House of Representatives was holding hearings when its chairman called the kind of filthy sex books sold at the corner store, which are affecting the youth of our country. Um, a, long y- a, y- a young lawyer in Cincinnati began Operation Newsstand, which developed into Citizens for Decent Literature with chapters throughout the country. Um, so there are a number of different groups like the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the National Association of Parents and Teachers, and the Roman Catholic National Organization for Decent Literature. Um, boy, these all sound like fun people to hang out with. (laughs) So the Lawrence PTA's Juvenile Protection Committee launched its own drive against inappropriate magazines, comics, and paperback stores. They sent volunteers to all the groceries, new drug stores, and newsstands in Lawrence, compiled detailed records on the objectionable material that they found on the shelves. Detective, romance, confidential, and male magazines were targeted, along with paperback books and comics. The information about individual stores is difficult to compare, for it may well tell us more about the sensibility of the surveyor than about the store's stock. One woman found a great deal to object to at every store she visited, while another seemed offended by little. But of the 20 establishments surveyed, only three displayed nothing deemed objectionable. In general, drug stores were worse than grocery stores, and the worst one of all was Green's newsstand, where approximately one-third of the 380 items were deemed unacceptable. Lawrence's citizens certainly had a wide variety of material to choose from, with the newsstand alone boasting 64 different male magazines, 35 in the romance confidential category, and more than 150 uh, comics, which were not even included in the newsstand's total of objectionable issues. Sexual material was clearly proliferating in public places, frequented by respectable people. Um, So a local news station ran an editorial praising the committee's efforts. It let people know that they should tell those businesses how you stand, let the PTA know you support them. So there was a push locally. So there's definitely like an attempt to control this spread of subversive material. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth remembering this material is proliferating partially because America has changed as a result of the war. Like, there's a lot more people who are open to these sorts of 
content, these sorts of discussions, this sort of literature. And it's going to be difficult to kind of unwind all of that because they're now mixed up all over the nation mm-hmm. rather than being in you know certain areas around the country. I think we're going to wrap up there. Um, that first section really, I think, establishes the groundworks. Things speed up pretty quickly after the war. Um, I would say the major themes here, um, correct me if you think differently, are elite control of small towns or smaller towns, uh, Lawrence frowning at me again, being subverted by federal intrusion into them, as well as the economic forces that kind of dictate what's acceptable in a community. Is there anything else? I think elite control being subverted by federal intrusion is less important than you make it out to be. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because... I don't see much direct, I see some direct federal intervention, obviously. Yeah. But. I, I guess, guess what I mean by that is I'm not saying the federal government is like sticking its fingers and everything. I'm saying the federal government is allocating resources. And as a result, attention is paid to issues that might not have normally gotten as much okay, attention. Okay, that's past. fair. So like, for instance, I don't think nearly as much attention would have been paid to VD outbreaks if the federal government hadn't provided ample funding sure. for VD clinics. Across that makes the sense. Um, so yeah, it's not like an insidious plot to bring CRT to all of our nation's yeah. schools. Or <laughs> it's like very much a economic need and social need the government wants being pushed in indirect and direct forms. And as a result, the community is altered. Yeah. And what was the second thing you said again? I already forgot. Cool. Well, I think (laughs) I'm sorry if this is repeating the second thing you said and you can cut it out if it is, but I think one of the themes in the book that's important is liberalization on the margins. Mm. Um, So like very gradual, sort of pushes to expand the balloon of what's acceptable, like little tiny breaths into the balloon of what's acceptable. Yeah. Um, as time goes on and as situations change in the town. That's, I think, a really good theme. And we'll return to that in part two. Protests definitely play a role during this period. People forming groups and like the activism that results from that definitely is important for these changes. But you're right, it's very much the small-scale changes that have the biggest impact over time. Mm -hmm. Um, They give one example later in the book. I keep saying they. I mean Beth. Beth, we love you. You're great. Um, Beth gives this example of a women's protest, I think, in the late 60s or early 70s, where a speaker came in to complain about how the university was treating women, how KU was, like, discriminating in its use of health care for women and men. So something like 77 women occupied the... Um, the, the, the department building for several nights and the department was like, okay, we acquiesce. You can have like the same healthcare privileges as everyone mm-hmm. else. And you might argue that's a form of like direct action causing a change, but that had already been something that was coming. Yeah. Like already Kansas and Lawrence in general had been changing how they approached like offerings of the, the birth control pill. Uh, and, you know, pretty much any woman in Lawrence could get access to the birth control pill at that time. And mm-hmm. there had already been conversations in the college about whether or not they would change their policies on, like, student insurance mm-hmm. and coverage. So, like, it played a role. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It definitely sped that up. But it was part of this larger trend where, like, bits and pieces had been attacked over time. And that change, you know, resulted. Absolutely. But, again, it wasn't as easy as person protests thing happens. Yeah. I'm really happy you could spend time with me today and call me Aww. out on my love. It's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to wrap up on? Um, nothing for me. Okay. Um, I love you. And I love you too. I hope that we don't break up because of this podcast where I said defamatory <laughs> things about your state. I started the podcast with a terrible Kansas joke. What are you talking about? That was a pretty good joke. Okay. Bye for now, y'all. Bye. <laughs>
we have many thanks for the use of our theme music, which is the song Drop by Ketza. You can find more of their music online at ketza.uk. You can also find Date These Guys online on Twitter and Instagram at at DateTheseGuys or visit DateTheseGuys.org. If you have questions for the podcast or want to be a wealthy sugar parent, please send an email to DateTheseGuys at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our work, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash date these guys. We have behind the scenes information, early episode access, participation in polls, and exclusive access to a guy's sibling map of date ideas for the Arizona area. Since the world sucks right now, we are currently donating all Patreon proceeds to trans organizations like Trevor Project, a trans suicide prevention organization, and moving assistance funds for those fleeing states outlawing their very existence. Please consider becoming a member and supporting our work today.